Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. Zechus Yom Adaf Ayin Aleph continues the Gemara's discussion of the order, the correct order of the various steps of the Kohen Gadol's Avoda on Yom Kippur. The Gemara will point out that there are two instances, the Gemara first says one, and then two instances in which the items that are listed in the order of the Psukim are out of order, and the Torah lists it in one order, but it's actually supposed to be in a different order, and the Gemara will prove that it has to be in a different order, what the sources for that are, we'll have two for each of them. The Gemara then, then describes a brief agarata of the uh, meeting between the Kohen Gadol and some other people after Yom Kippur, and it'll explain a few Psukim on the Darach of Agarata that are related to that. Then we get to our next Mishnah. The Mishnah discusses the Big Day Kahuna, what the four Big Day Kahuna of a Kohen Hedyet were, what the eight Big Day Kahuna of a Kohen Gadol were, and the Gemara will describe how they were made, from what number of threads they were spun and woven. So let's begin. The Gemara says that we know that the Psukim, the way they describe the Avodah, break it up into three sections. There is the first Third, which is the avoda that is done every day in the base of Mikdash, that's done by the Kohen Gadol in his big days of. Then there's the middle, which is all the Yom Kippur things, that's done by the Kohen Gadol in his big day of, and those are all put together as one in the Psukim. And then afterwards is all the afternoon regular service of the base of Mikdash, which is all done by the Kohen Gadol in his big days of. But all the big day love and all the Yom Kippur things are put together as one. There's no interruption there. Says the Gemara, the last step of the big day lavan is out of order. There's actually something that interrupts before the last step. The last step is going is when the Kohen Gadol goes back into the Kodesh Kedoshim to take out the spoon and the shovel that he put there with Ketores. He has to go take that out. That's not together with everything else. That's separate. And there is some part of the Avoda that he does in big day Zov that has to interrupt. Something has to be uh, put in between there. And that's actually moved to a later step. So Gemara says, uh, why would we, wh- what's the source for that? Why do we say that? And we'll have two things. First of all, what interrupts? And second of all, how do we know something's supposed to interrupt? So the Gemara, first of all, says, um, we know that something has to interrupt, and the Gemara gives two sources for this. Number one is because we have a halacha moshmisine, that the Kangada has to change clothing five times on Yom Kippur. The way it's described in the Pesukim, there are only three changes. Gold clothing, white clothing, and gold clothing. So you have to take the white clothing and split it up. We have to take some ma- some aspect of the gold clothing and insert it somewhere between the white clothing activities. That way you'll have gold, white, gold, white, gold. Then you'll have five. The Gemara's second source is that in describing the Kohen Gadol changing into his big day Zav, in the end... It says, and he should take off the white clothing that he put on. So he says, what if, uh, for sure he takes off the clothing he put on. What else does he take off? Obviously he has to take off something that he put on. So he says, it means to say he should take off something that he put on before and took off already and put on again. That's what it means. So it has to be that the white clothing was put on and off twice. And that way, the last time when we say you should take off the clothing you put on, he's talking about that it was put on twice. So now we know that something has to be interrupted. So the Gemara says the last step is the one that is interrupted. The last step is the one that's moved. question is what interrupts. So the Gemara says what interrupts is the two alim, the two rams that are brought as a carbon ola, as part of the musaf of Yom Kippur. It's a carbon musaf, and therefore it's regular big days of avoda. It's not special Yom Kippur avoda, even though it's a Yom Kippur musaf, but musaf occurs many days of the year. So this is what is put there to interrupt. Says the Gemara, why do you say that that's put there to interrupt? That's written in the Psukim later. You have to take it out of order to say that that's what interrupts. I have a better idea, the Gemara says. And there's the Sara Nasa Bechutz. There's a goat, which is also part of the Mosav, that's not even mentioned in the entire Yom Kippur Avod and Parshas Achimos. It's only mentioned in uh, Parshas Pinchas. So that we could put wherever we want in the order of the Avodah. The Torah doesn't say where it goes. You don't have to take things out of the out of the order in which they're written, take something which isn't written there at all and insert it between the most of the steps in the Big Day Lavan and the last step in the Big Day Lavan. So the Gemara says, no, we can't. It's got to be that it's the two Elim that interrupts. And the Gemara gives the reason for it. Reason number one, 
the Gemara says, is because the two, um, the only reason that is, that's given for this, the Gemara says, is because when the Torah describes the step of the two Elim, it says, V'yatza v'asa. He goes out, meaning he goes out of the uh, inner service section. He goes out of the avoda that's done in the white clothing. He goes out of that, and right away, what he does is, is the two elim. So you see, the two elim is what is performed right when he's going out. The first time he goes out of the big day love and he goes out of the avodas pnim, that's when he goes straight to the two elim, and therefore that is the first thing that he does the first time he removes the big day love, and that's what has to interrupt between the two things. Okay, now, the Gemara, this is the discussion of the interruption in the white clothing service. The Gemara's introduction to it had said that this is the only thing which is out of order in the Pesuk. The Gemara asks, it's not correct to say that this is the only thing that's listed out of order in the Pesuk. And there's another thing that's listed out of order in the Pesuk. And that's the burning of the parts of the Sire and the Par, Chatas, and Asa Bifnim, those parts that are supposed to be put in the Mazbech Chitzon and burned. The Torah lists that before the burning of the carcasses of the Par and the Sire outside the camp in the Makam Adeshen. So the Torah says that the, the Emurim are burned first, but it's not true. We see in a Mishnah that they're not burned until much later, until afterwards. So Gemara says, so that's also placed out of order. So Gemara says, yeah, that's another thing that's out of order. When we said this, the only thing that's out of order, we meant up till this point is the only thing that's out of order. So Gemara says, well, why do we say that the Mishnah is right, that the Psukim are out of order? Why don't we just say that the Psukim are right and the Mishnah is out of order? And isn't that a more logical thing to switch? So Gemara says, no. It has to be that um, you could learn from the words descri- by which the psukim used to describe it, to uh, describe the burning of the carcasses of the Parnasar, that that has to have taken place earlier. Where do you see that? Because when the Torah talks about the becoming tame, that the person who brought the par and the sar to burn becomes tame. It says it together with the person who brought the Sahar Mishdaleach to become Tame. It says both of them become Tame, and it uses the same phrase for both. It says, Hamishaleach, the one who sends, who sent the par, the one who sent the Sar to Azazel, and Hasoyref, the one who burned the carcasses. It says these two things with the same phrase, and it says that these two become Tame. It refers to both of them in the same expression. Now, the Azazel, the one who sent to the Azazel, that was way before all of this. That was long before uh, the Emuri Chatas, that's for sure. So therefore, since that was before the Emuri Chatas, we're also going to conclude that the burning of the Parnasar was also before the Emuri Chatas, because they both use the same phrase, that it's something, the Hamish Alech and Hasar, if those who did this already, they become Tameh. So the did this already refers to before. So the says, well, how do you know that they both happened before? Maybe learn the other way. Maybe learn that they both happened after. You're right, you're linking the Sarah Mishdaleach, and you're linking the burning of the par and the Echatas. So something is out of order here, because one is listed before the Emurim, and one is listed after the Emurim, okay? So how do you know that they're both supposed to be before the Emurim? Maybe they're both supposed to be after the Emurim. The Emurim says no. So look carefully at the passage about the Sarah Mishdaleach, and it says that the person who brought the Sarah Mishdaleach becomes Tommy, it says, Veha Mishdaleach, the one who did it. That means that he did it earlier. Something that was done previously. So it has to be that that was done all the way in the beginning, previously. And therefore, we're not going to move that to later. Instead, we'll move the burning, the seirev, to earlier. And we'll give us another explanation of how we know the sar HaMeshalech couldn't happen later. That's from the phrase, Ya'amad Chai. The Torah says that that sar has to stand and wait for the slaughter of the sar HaNazah B'fnim and its application of its blood on the Parochas. So it says, Ya'amad Chai, it has to stand alive. How long does it stand alive for? The Gemara says, until Shas Kapara. When is the Shas Kapar? When the blood is applied. So you see that right afterwards it doesn't have to stand alive anymore, and as soon as that is finished, it goes to Azazel right away. It doesn't go to Azazel after the Emur Echaz. It doesn't wait for all that. Okay, this concludes the Gemara's discussion of the order. Now the Gemara talks about what happened the next day. The Gemara says the person who took the Sar Mishdaleach would meet the Kohen Gadol, and he would greet him. And depending where he would meet him, he would greet him differently. If he met him in the street, he would greet him in a way that is mechabed him, and he would say, Ishi, my, Ishi Kain Gadol, my master, Kain Gadol, we did your message, we did your mission, we were your messengers faithfully, we sent the goat off the Azazel correctly. 
That's what he would say if he met him in the street and there were people around for which, or in front of which, he should show cover to the Kohen Gadol. If, however, he met him at home, in one of their homes, then he would say to him, Mechaye Chayim, the one who gives life to the living, referring to Hashem, Asinu Shlichusai, we did his messenger, his uh, mission, we fulfilled his um, mission faithfully. So that's showing cover to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not to the Kohen Gadol itself. Okay, the Gemara now shows another place where this phrase Mechaye Chayim is used. The Gemara says that Rabbah says, when the Rabbanon of Pompadis used to take leave of each other, they would ask permission to go home, and they would bless each other and say, Mechayichayim, itin lochachayim, aruchem, betovim, umetukanim. He who gives life to the living should give you long, good, and proper life. The Gemara has another couple of psukim here that it'll explain in a similar vein. The Pesach is, Halech lefnei Hashem what is, I will, I will walk before Hashem in the land of the living. What's the land of the living? What is David Amalek referring to? Zerv Hidus says it's referring to places that have marketplaces, places that have a busy, a busy and bustling lifestyle. That there's, um, there's life and there's goodness going on there. That's where he wants to be, not wandering around in the Midbar like he did when he was fleeing from Shaul. Next Pesach, Ki Orch Yamim, Ushnos Chaim V'Shalom Yosif Ulach, that a long days and years of life and peace will add to you. The Gemara says, what do you mean years of life? Of course years of life. You don't add years to somebody that's not of life. That's not called adding him years. The Gemara says, what it means to say is years that will change from bad to good. If somebody is poor in his youth, he will change to being wealthy in his old age. You'll call them Shnei uh, Chaim. He changed his years to the good. Next passage the Gemara discusses is Aleichem Ishim Ekra. To you, the Ishim, I will call. Now, Ishim means men, but the word for men is usually Anashim. What is the word Ishim? Where it says it's referring to Talmud Chachamim, and it calls them Ishim because it's like the word Isha, to show that they are like women in the sense that they are um, they are uh, generally weaker because they sit and learn all the time, and they are softer, they are easier to deal with, they're not so difficult like non Talmud Chachamim men are. And the Gemara then also says that actually the word Ishim could be referred to Karbanas. Karbanas are called Isha, and this teaches us that if somebody wants to do Nisach Yayin on the Mizbech, he wants to pour wine on the Mizbech like they did in the times of the base of Migdash, he should pour wine into the throats of Tamina Chachamim, meaning he should support them, because Tamina Chachamim are also called Ishim. Now the Gemara, that last explanation was given by Rabbi Berachia. The Gemara gives another statement from Rabbi Berachia. He says, if somebody sees that the Torah is leaving his descendants, his children are not becoming to Chachamim, he should marry a Bas Taman Chacham. Machlok is if that means he himself should marry another wife who is a Bas Taman Chacham, who is the daughter of a Taman Chacham, or means he should marry off his wayward sons to a Bas Taman Chacham because she'll straighten him out. What's the Pasuk? That's the source. Im Yaskin Ba'aretz Shoshai. If his roots become old in the land, Uba'afa Yom Azgizai, and his trunk is dying in the dirt, Meireach Mayim Yafriach V'asakatsai Kemarinata. Then he should take a whiff, a scent of water, and blossom, and uh, make um, things to plow and plant. So, you should go for the scent of water that refers to the Bas Tamil Chacham who grew up in a house of Talmud Chacham, even if she never got a chance to learn herself. Okay, the Gemara now refers to the last line in the mission that said, uh, the King Gadol used to make a Yom Tov, used to make a celebration. He gave Kiddush after he came out of the Beis HaMikdash. Uh, Bishalom in peace. The Gemara quotes a Brisa. This is a famous incident where the Kohen Gadol came out of the Beis HaMikdash in peace, and he was greeted by a lot of people. They were walking with him, and then they saw Shmaya and Avitalian, the two leading Talmud Chachamim, and they all left the Kohen Gadol and went to surround Shmaya and Avitalian because Talmud Chachamim deserved covered over Kohen Gadol, even if the uh, uh, especially if the Kohen Gadol is in Amaretz, which happened often in the Bayis Sheni. So the Gemara says that the Kohen Gadol was upset, and when Shemayin Avatayin came to take leave from him, he said that those people descended from the Gaim should go in peace, because Shemayin Avatayin were both converts. They were Geirim. So Shemayin Avatayin said to him, better that the descendants of the nations who act like our own, should go in peace, than the descendant of Aaron, who does not act like Aaron, because Aaron himself was a man of peace, and you, apparently, are not, even though you're a descendant of Aaron. 
Okay, this takes us to our next mission. The mission describes the big day kahuna, and it says that the Kohen Gadol had eight garments, and the Kohen Hedyad had four. The same four applied to the Kohen Hedyad and the Kohen Gadol, and that was the kisonas, the long uh, cloak, which was like a shirt that extended all the way to the heels. Mechnasayim is the pants, the trousers. Mitznefes is the hat or turban. Machlok is showing him how it was exactly. Was it a hat or was it a turban that was wrapped around the head? And the avnate is the belt that they wore. Those four were worn by everybody. The Kohen Gadol had four additional ones. It's the Choshen. There's the 12 stones on the breastplate, which holds within it the Yom Betumim. There's the Efo, that is an apron that was wrapped around behind him with two straps coming up from the waist that the Choshen was affixed to. It was the Me'il, which was a long robe. Machok Shoshanim, if it had sleeves or not, a long robe that had Rimonim, pomegranates, and bells hanging from the bottom, and of course the tits, a thin gold strip that was on his forehead that had the words Kodesh Lashem on it. Now, he wore these when, when uh, he was asked a question to the Urim Vatumim, and you don't ask the Urim Vatumim for any random person, you only ask for a king, for the Av Beisdin, the head of the court, or somebody who is needed by the public for whatever reason it is. The Gemara now begins, and it discusses the weaving and the spinning of the threads that were used to make the Big Day Kahuna. What, the way it worked was as follows. You would have a number of threads of one material. Those threads would be spun together to make strings, and then the strings would be woven together to form the cloth. So the Gemara says that there were alternately the amount of threads spun together to make the strings were six on some of them, or eight in some of them, and... Um, possibly more, as we shall see. And the Gemara describes it as follows. It brings a brisa, which says, any time the Torah describes something as sheish, sheish means linen, but sheish also means the number six, anything which is described as sheish, its strings are made out of three, out of six different threads woven together. When it says mazar, it's made out of eight threads woven together, when it said the me'il was made out of 12 threads woven together in each string, the parochas, the curtain between the Kodesh and the Kodesh Kedoshim was made out of 24 threads woven together in each string, and the Choshen and the Ephah were made out of 28 threads woven together in each string. So the Gemara says, how does this work? How do we learn each of these things? How do we know that anytime it says sheish, which is linen, it was six threads woven together? So the Gemara says, because the Pasuk, which uses the word sheish redundantly. It uses it five times. It says, Vayasu es ha-kisonas sheish, ves ha-mitznefes sheish, ves pari ha-megubayis sheish, ves mechnasi abad sheish, mashzar. It uses five times the word sheish. It could have just said them all together and said that they were all sheish mashzar. So what are the five times? So one of them is to teach me that it was made out of sheish, that we need, that it was made out of linen. The second one is to teach me, is to use the number six, to teach me that there were six threads woven together in each string. The one after that is to tell me that all these threads were spun together. They weren't just put together, they were spun together. And then the next one is to tell me that they were all, all other types of clothing that has the word sheish were all done the same way. Even the ones that don't say the word sheish were all spun the same way. And the last one is to tell me that you have to do it this way. It's a requirement, it's ma'akiv if you don't do it this way. So I think says, well, how do you know that the word sheish means linen? The word bad and Pishton mean linen. Uh, actually, bad, we don't know what that means either. Pishton is linen. Sheish, uh, what's the proof that Sheish means linen? So the Gemara says because the Pasuk describing the Mechnasayim, the pants, calls it bad and Sheish. And bad means a pole. So a pole refers to linen which grows on a single stalk, it doesn't grow with branches. So Gemara says it maybe refers to wool. Wool grows a single hair at a time. It doesn't branch off. Gemara says, no, the wool hair is split. They uh, they don't stay solid. They split in the ends. So Gemara says, well, flax also splits. Gemara says, flax splits when you beat Flax is l- l- linen. Flax splits when you beat it. Wool splits as it's growing. So in its growing state, you can't call it a bot. Uh, the bot, a single pole, applies only to linen. So that's how we know that that's what it's referring to. That's what bad is linen and sheish, which is listed, which is a sheish and bad, are both words clearly used to describe the same material. Sheish, therefore, is linen as well. So now the Gemara gives another source. The Gemara says in the 
pasuk in Yecheskel describing the big Dikuna says Pari Pishtim Yu Al Roshim and Michlan say Pishtim Yu Al Mosneim. They have a linen hat. They use the word Pishtim clearly. Linen hat and linen pants. Where it says, how could this be the source? That means that until Yecheskel came and said this, we didn't know what to make the big day Kuna out of. There were hundreds of years of big day Kuna before him. Where it says, that's not a kasha. Uh, we find that we learn the halacha that uh, a Kohen is not allowed to do avod unless he has a bris milah. We learn that from a, a pasuk in Yecheskel also. Kol ben nechar orel lev orel basar lo yavoy el mikdash ilushar seini. So clearly, we could learn halachas from Yechazkel. Then you'll ask, what? Where did they know the halacha until then? Until then, they had halachal majmi sinai. Yechazkel came and he set it out. Now we have a pasuk that spells it out. But before then, we didn't have a scriptural source. So that's why we're giving you the scriptural source over here. Okay. Now the Gemara goes further and it discusses the uh, rimonim, the pomegranates that are on the bottom of the mill. And the Gemara says those were made from 24 uh, twined threads. So it says, how do you know that they were made for 24 twined threads? The Gemara says, I linked them to the parechas. The parechas I know were made of 24 twined threads because there were four materials. And each material, we said, was sheish. You had to have six of each. So four materials, six of each in the parechas. That's a total of 24 threads. And we say that the me'il was the same. Also had to have 24 threads. Now the me'il was only made out of three materials. So if there's only three materials and there were a total of 24 threads, there had to be eight of each uh, type of material that were twined together. I think Morris says, that is my source, that this is what we were looking for, that the term mashzar, because the word mashzar is used there, the term mashzar is uh, eight of each type twined together. Ask the Gemara, how do you know that you should learn from the parochas, which had 24 total threads, maybe learn from the uh, Choshen and the Ephod, which were made out of 28 total threads, like we said earlier, and we'll derive later. So there are 28 total threads. How do you know that you should connect it to the uh, parochas, which had the 24 threads? So the, the Gemara said, very simple. The the me'il didn't have gold on it, and the parochas didn't have gold on it. I'd rather learn, I'd ra- I would r- rather connect two things that are similar in the sense that they don't have gold, than connect to the choshen and the uh, ephod, which did have gold. And we said, no, you shouldn't look at it that way. The me'il is more similar to the choshen and the ephod. The choshen, the ephod, and the me'il are all clothing. The parochas is not clothing, it's a curtain. So he says, you're right. So we're not learning, you're right. We're not We're not really learning from the parochas, we're learning from the avnet. The avnet was the belt that is clothing, that was also 24 strands woven in it together, that did not, uh, the t- 24 strands spun together, we should say, that did not have gold in it. Therefore, we learn the correct number from the avnet, the belt, to the mill, and therefore we know it's supposed to be 24 threads, and again, it's only three materials, so it has to be Eight of each, and that's what is meant whenever it says the word mushzar. So Gemara says that there's another source here, and that is that the Choshen and the Ephod are learned from each other. And it says the word Ta'asenu. It says you should make the Ephod and the Choshen similar to Ta'asenu. You should make one like the other Ta'asenu. You should make it. But only it should be made in that way, not anything else. And therefore you shouldn't learn from the Choshen or the Ephod to the uh, Me'il. Gemara gives one final source for this. The Gemara says it can't possibly be 28 threads. Because 28 is not divisible by 3. There are 3 materials, and we know you have to have an equal number of each material. It says, um, Vasisa, and Vasisa teaches me, Kalasuyas Shavos. Everything has to be equal. So if I have 3 materials, and I'm going to have a total of 24 threads, I could have 8 of each. If I'm going to have 3 materials and a total of 28 threads, I won't be able to have an even number of any of them. If I have 9 materials... Of each is too little. If I have ten, it's too much. If I have nine of some and ten of another, then that's not equal. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzhak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.